Hi, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Are we good? Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining us for the World Lemur Festival. We have lemur trivia going on today. Um, thank you guys so much. So, And I see we have some attendees on Zoom and also on Facebook Live. So hello to everyone, wherever you're viewing us from. Um, I'm going to share my screen so we can get started. We're excited to do some lemur trivia today. Okay, so here we are for lemur trivia, the 2020 World Lemur Festival. And I want to let everybody know who is here today. So I'm Lynn, I'm with the Lemur Conservation Network. And we also have Susie. Susie, do you want to introduce yourself and what you do for Conservation Fusion? You're on mute, I believe. There, how's that? Perfect. <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Susie Lewis and I work with uh, Conservation Fusion. Um, just really quick, we're an international nonprofit organization. So we work both here in the US and in Madagascar and we work at, at three sites in Madagascar and um, everything we do is education based. So uh, we're working in schools uh, with hands on things like planting trees, conservation camps, eco trips, working with teachers, women's associations. Um, but everything is is just um, education based and a way to create a balance between people, wildlife and and the ecosystems, as, of course, especially lemurs. Awesome. And we also have Jessica from the Louisiana Lemur Foundation. So welcome, Jessica. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, what the Lemur, Louisiana Lemur Foundation is all about? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you guys for having me today. Uh, so the Louisiana Lemur Foundation, we're committed to conservation, education, and scientific discovery. The foundation's main goal is to build a network of facilities, starting with one in Southeast Louisiana, that will provide much needed space to rescue and rehabilitate lemurs from the pet trade. Uh, serve the community as an outdoor classroom to learn about lemurs and wildlife conservation in general, and support and participate in lemur conservation efforts worldwide to help save these critically endangered primates. Awesome. And then we also have Laura Howard, who is with the Lemur Conservation Network as well, and she'll be providing tech support. So Laura, if you want to just introduce what people should be doing throughout the chat, if they have any trouble, and about the Q&A and all that. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so if you have any questions for our guests or host today, uh, you can use uh, for the folks that are on zoom, at least um, you can use the Q&A function. And if you see someone else's question that you also would like to hear answered, you have the option to upvote, which will kind of put that question to the top of the list. And um, if you have any technical questions, you can use the chat feature and I will be looking at those and I can respond to you and help you out if you need anything. Again, this is if you're on Zoom, if you're watching on Facebook Live, um, just you're, you're here for the show. So thanks for being here. Yeah, and you can also add some, um, if you have any particular questions, you could add them in the comments and Facebook too. And if we don't get to your questions, today, then maybe we will use that as sort of something to talk more about on Facebook in the future and our, or on Twitter and different things like that. So that would be awesome. So don't hold back on any questions you have for any of us. Um, so awesome. So thank you guys all for being here. And I just wanted to tell everybody a little bit about the World Lemur Festival. So that's where we're here. And we're excited to kick it off today for with the Lemur Conservation Network. So the Lemur World Lemur Festival is celebrated in Madagascar and around the world at zoos, at schools, um, and this year we're having a lot of virtual events, so that's kind of cool because you can join from anywhere. Um, so this is our first virtual event for the Lemur Conservation Network, and then on Wednesday we have a panel discussion on conservation optimism in Madagascar, and Susie will actually be joining that one as well to talk a little more about her work and also um, we have some other conservation experts joining that one, so that will be really interesting. 
And then on Thursday, we have a Madagascar travel showcase, which we have four travel specialists from different travel agencies that serve Madagascar. And they'll be talking about different regions of Madagascar, the lemurs you can see there, what you can do. So I know we can't all travel right now to Madagascar, but I know I am looking forward to going back soon. So be excited to hear what they all have to say. So this is how we're gonna work today. So we have four rounds of trivia with five questions per round. And then we'll be asking some questions throughout a little bit of Susie and Jessica, but then we'll have a little deeper dive questions after the second and fourth round. And um, so it's, we're pretty casual. Like, you know, if you want to just take down your answers and then we'll go over the questions, you can sort of see how many you get right. You can post in the chat so we can see um, or the comments on Facebook, see how well people are doing. Or if you want to play against your family and friends at home, then you can kind of have bragging rights and uh, see who knows the most about lemurs in Madagascar in your family. So however you want to work it. So the first round we're going to do is all about Madagascar. And then rounds two and three are about lemurs and then leading a little bit into lemur conservation. And then round four, we're going to focus on how you can help. And then, so we'll have Q&A with Jessica and Susie throughout. And then at the end, we'll take some questions. So I'm excited. So let's get started. All right. So the first round, round one, Madagascar. This photo is from one of my favorite places, Kianjvatu, which is where Susie works too. Um, beautiful view of the forest and the scenery there. So the first question in round one, question one, is about how large Madagascar is. So this question, you say Madagascar is the only place lemurs live naturally in the wild, and it's also the world's fourth largest island. So how big is it? Which US state is closest in size to Madagascar? So your choices are Delaware, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, or Rhode Island? I feel like this is a kind of a tough one because it's hard to tell in relation to Africa how big that is. You know, you're just looking at a map. So what do we think? Delaware, Texas, Florida, Tennessee, or Rhode Island? Okay. And so the second question, for round one is a little more geography related also. So Madagascar is about 250 miles off the east coast of Africa. Which other island or group of islands is closest to Madagascar? So we have Mauritius, Reunion, Zanzibar, the Seychelles, or the Comoros. I think these are all places I would like to go but have not yet been to. <laughs> I've heard good things. Okay. So again, which island or group of islands is closest to Madagascar is question two. All right. Question three. Madagascar is home to 27 million people and 18 Malagasy tribes, each having a unique culture. But one thing they have in common is food. So what food do most Malagasy people eat at least once per day and often more? We have options being chicken, sweet potato, rice, beef, or quinoa. All right, what food do most Malagasy people eat at least once per day? Okay, question four in round one. These people look like they're having some fun. The most, this is a true or false question. The most widely accepted theory for how lemurs got to Madagascar is that lemurs floated from mainland Africa on a raft of vegetation. It probably didn't look too much like this, if that's what happened. Just guessing, but so true or false? 
Okay, this is the last question in round one. 98% of lemur species are in danger of extinction. Which of these is not an extinct animal that once lived in Madagascar? Or you can choose that all of them are extinct animals that once lived in Madagascar. So we have a koala lemur, elephant bird, saber-toothed cat, giant sloth lemur, dwarf hippo, or all of them are extinct animals that once lived in Madagascar. Okay, so that's it for round one. Do we want, do, does anybody need me to go back and review any of them or are we good? We can do real quickly. So the first one, since I know we're getting start getting the hang of things and some people might be coming in late, is which US state is closest in size to Madagascar? And also I wanna point out when I'm giving the answers, I'm not necessarily gonna be saying like the letter in the trivia, it's more like what the answer is. So if you just write down like A, C, D, like you might get confused. So better to write down like the actual answer. And then the second question, round one, is which other island or group of islands is closest to Madagascar? Round three, what food do most Malagasy people eat at least once per day? Round four, or question four, I mean. Um, true or false? Lemurs, it's believed that lemurs floated from mainland Africa on a raft of vegetation. And then the last question in round five, or round one, is which of these is not an extinct animal that once lived on Madagascar? Okay. So while everybody's getting their final answers ready, before we get to the, um, the, the correct answers, I wanted to ask Susie and Jessica what your favorite lemur species is and why. Do you want to start, Susie? You're muted. <laughs> Got it. Okay, I'm gonna be get the hang of this, you guys. Um, I'll tell you my my favorite lemur species. It's hard to pick a favorite, but if I had to, I would pick the eye eye. And the reason that they're my they're my favorite is because um, in Madagascar there are five full families of lemurs, and the eye eye takes up a family all of its own. And some of the reasons that they're very special is um, I have a oh I moved him. I have like a little stuffed animal one, but if you see an eye eye, you can see that they have huge ears and so they're they're very adapted to their environment. So they're very elusive. We don't a lot of we don't know a whole lot about them, but we're learning about them. And they have these giant ears. And the reason for those big ears is because um, they mainly eat eat insects and grubs. And so they also have these extended long middle fingers. So if I was an eye eye, my middle finger would be like coming out about this far. And so they're also the only um, primates that have teeth that continually grow like a, like a rodent yeah. or a rabbit. And so think about that. They, they have to gnaw those, those teeth down to keep them from growing back into their skulls. So the, how they do that, the, the eye eye is so specially adapted. Um, it has these giant ears. It listens to like to trees. First, it uses that finger and it does a series of taps like it does like tap 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 like it's always in threes and so they tap on the trees and then with those big ears they listen to see if they can hear insects or grubs inside and if they do they use those um special super strong teeth to um take make a little hole into the the tree and then they use that finger that long finger to extract insects so um yeah the eye eye is definitely my my favorite lemur just because they're so unique. And if you ever see one, um, they're also kind of weird looking and that I like them for that reason too. Like their heads almost look like they're way, way too big for their bodies. Um, and they, ha they have like a small body and then they have a great big, huge, like wiry tail. So they're just really kind of so weird that they're 
they're very unique. So I would say the eye eye is my favorite lemur. Yeah. Some people say they look like goblins or something yeah. like that. Sort of perfect for World Lemur Day and Halloween coming up. Yeah, so for, that's for cool. sure. What about you, Jessica? What's your favorite lemur species? Oh gosh. Uh, so yeah, like Susie said, it's really hard to pick a, a single favorite. Um, I think it's a tie for me between uh, black and white rough lemurs and Indri. Uh, so one of the items on my bucket list is to hear an Indri call in the wild. Their song is just one of the most beautiful things that I've ever heard and I'd love the chance to experience that in person one day. Um, but on the other hand, most of my actual direct experience working with lemurs has been with black and white roughs. Um, and so they just kind of hold a special place in my heart. So the, the lemurs that actually inspired me to start working on the Louisiana Lemur Foundation uh, is a pair of black and white roughs that I worked with at the Audubon Zoo. Shout out to Gascar and Tahiri. <laughs> um, but I just, I love the black and white roughs, gentle and laid back nature, uh, their curiosity, and of course their fluffy ruffed fur. <laughs> yes, they are super fluffy. <laughs> Very cute. Yeah, my favorite is the Kokoral Shafaka, and it's the first lemur species I saw in the wild in Madagascar. So that was really awesome. It was in Ankarafanska National Park in the northwest. And so they're just, I mean, they're beautiful too. And they leap between trees and they can leap really far. So they're super cool, but just a special place in my heart since like, they're the first ones I saw. Awesome. Okay. So let's get to the round one answers. So, and I'm curious if anybody is surprised by any of these. Um, so the first question, what US state is closest in size to Madagascar? The answer for that one is Texas. And it's slightly smaller than Texas. But I think it's, it's about 90% the size of Texas, but it is the state that's closest in size. So I think when you see Madagascar on the map, you don't think, it's hard to tell how big it is. And because Africa as a continent is so huge, so next to it, it just doesn't look that big. Um, but it is very large. And so that's why it's like, you know, I've been to Madagascar three times and I feel like you could just keep going back and back and back because there's so many, it's so big and there's so many places to see amazing things. So yeah, it's kind of amazing. Um, so then question two, is what island or group of island is closest to Madagascar? And that's actually the Comoros. So Mauritius and Reunion and Comoros are all fairly close to Madagascar, but Comoros is closest. And question three, what food do most Malagasy people eat at least once a day? And that is rice. Rice is very important to Malagasy culture and people and it's a lot of times people will eat it for every meal um and there's even a tea made out of rice in madagascar so it's very important question four true or false lemurs floated to madagascar in a raft of vegetation that one is true so it probably didn't look like that whitewater rafting situation but they think that um they just were on you know raft of vegetation. So that's the latest theory. And question five, which is not an extinct animal that once lived on Madagascar, that was the saber-toothed cat. So the other ones was the koala lemur, sloth lemur, elephant bird, and the dwarf hippopotamus. Um, so those are all extinct animals that once lived on Madagascar, which is pretty cool. Okay. So we are ready to go into round two. Wonder how everybody did. Did you get, did anybody get all five right? Um, <laughs> Susie says no. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't realize Comoros was the closest island chain. I don't, I don't think I would have gotten that right. So that was fun. Yeah. Yeah, I had to like look it up on the map because I wasn't sure myself either when I was writing out the question, so. <laughs> Cool. Okay, round two. This one is all about lemurs, of course, which made sense because it's lemur trivia. Okay, so the first question is a great question. New lemur species are being discovered every year. How many unique lemur species are recognized by science right now? So this is kind of a tricky question because it's 
kind of changing a lot. So um, we, our options are 37, 50, 76, 111, or 142. So if you know sort of about what it is, then you can probably guess based on the options. But it is, this is always a difficult question to answer. So how many unique lemur species are recognized by science right now? Okay. Question two. Oh, this is a good one. I don't know if there's any fans of the DreamWorks movie Madagascar or all of the special Madagascar shows that they have. Um, so there's three characters in the DreamWorks Madagascar pictured in this image. So if everybody, if the question, the question is to name the lemur species of each character. So we have King Julian, Maurice, and Mort. My personal favorite is Mort because he's goofy. I mean, they're all goofy. But so name the lemur species of each character. Round to question three. This is another true or false. Male and female lemurs hold equal amounts of power. So that's true or false. Male and female lemurs hold equal amounts of power. This photo is of crown chafakas. They're beautiful. I have not seen them yet in the wild, but I hope to. Okay, round two, question four. This is a tough one. So which of the following speech or which of the following statements is not true about one of the lemur species? So you can either pick if you if you think like three are true and the rest aren't, or if you think that they're all true, like picking which ones you think are actually true. So A is it eats an A, there is a species that eats an amount of cyanide daily that would kill a human. Second one is there's a species that uses the toxins and millipedes to get rid of parasites. And then C, it has an extra long middle finger that it uses to dig for food. We might have given you a hint about this one earlier. Um, and then the fourth option is it is so small that it only weighs about one ounce. It's very small. And then the fifth one is there's a species that lives only in the marshes around a single lake. And then you can say if all of these are true or if only a certain ones are true. So that's question four. Okay. Move on to question five. This is a good one. Do lemurs like to move it, move it? <laughs> Options here are yes, no, and yes, unless they are in torpor, whatever that is. And you can see there's some lemurs moving it here, and then there's a ringtail lemur is like, come on, people, stop it with the Madagascar movie. <laughs> okay, round two, question five. Do lemurs like to move it, move it? Okay, well, everybody's getting there answers ready. Let's ask another question. So Jessica, what do you love most about Madagascar? Oh gosh, uh, so I think the coolest thing about Madagascar is how many different habitats there are in on one island um, and how that in turn allows for such biodiversity of the species on Madagascar. I mean you can have you know, a typical lush rainforest, a dry spiny forest, there's just such variation. So I think that's really neat. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. What about you, Susie? You're muted. <laughs> yep, I was like, I'm gonna unmute myself. I'm gonna get that by the end. Um, I think my favorite thing that I love the most about Madagascar is, is the people of, Mad of Madagascar. And, um, you know, the culture, is just so special and I it was in one of our 
previous questions about the different tribes and there are 18 different tribes in Madagascar and we actually work at three different sites in Madagascar one at the tip top in the middle and then in the southwest and each one of those um, communities that we work with is so different and so unique and um, I just really love the the Malagasy people who are are really the ones safeguarding all those lemurs so I just really enjoy working with the Malagasy people and learning um, about the their different culture and the different beliefs that they have and how they have similar and, and different beliefs you know even about lemurs so I think that's one of, of course I agree with Jessica like the biodiversity and and even what Lynn was talking about how amazing Madagascar is and the different um, ecosystems is just mind-blowing but I really do love the people of Madagascar. Yeah definitely and it is interesting how there's so many different cultures and you go to different mm -hmm. areas of the country and you know people are wearing different styles of clothes and there's different types of architecture and it's just it's really interesting from that perspective too. Yes for sure. Awesome. Okay, so now we are ready for the answers to round two. So the first one, how many lemur species are recognized by science right now? So the answer for that is 111. And I'm curious, Susie, if you could talk a little bit about like why this number changes so much or like why there's new species being discovered all the time, like what's that about? Yes. Um, yeah. And sometimes even for myself, like working so closely with scientists from in Madagascar all the time, it's hard to keep up with the numbers. So we were just discussing this because um, people were saying 112. And what happens is um, it's kind of unheard of, but, but lemurs, new lemur species are being described, new lemur species unknown to science are being described all the time. So it was 112. And the, the most recent um, publication was was naming a new type of mouse lemur after uh, Dr. Jonah Rotsamzafi. At the same time, it was naming a new species of mouse lemur. Another species of mouse lemur, Microsubus vinermeyeri, was assumed, which means that um, it was taken off of the species list. So it's changing all the time. Um, I I know there are a lot of scientists out there working on describing new species of lemurs. And um, in fact, my husband, Dr. Lewis, has named 22 new species of lemurs. And I can tell you there's more. There's more new lemur species being identified. And just to say a little bit about that, one of the reasons why there are so many new species of primates, if you think about it, these are new species of primates being discovered in the 21st century, so it's an incredible. And part of the reason is because a lot of the forests in Madagascar are fragmented, and so these lemurs are being isolated, but not only by um, anthropogenic things like humans, um, also by rivers and roads, we can see that those are barriers. And sometimes rivers act as barriers to um, like maybe a mouse lemur species, but there are other animals in Madagascar, like uh, the small chameleons who can actually go on branches and then the branches can bend over and they can cross the river. So um, even though rivers could be a, a barrier for speciation in some of the, the primate species, they can actually not be a barrier for some of the other species of Madagascar. So it's very interesting and the numbers are changing all the time and just keep your eyes peeled because there, the, I'm sure that the number is going to be increasing again. Yeah, you said that um, there was a mouse lemur species that was taken off of the list. Like, why was it taken off? Like, was it com considered uh, to be okay. part of so there, there is, of yeah, there's a process to to naming a new species of lemurs. And so, um, way like a decade ago, when they, they were really naming a lot of new species of lemurs, um, it used to be like you had to have a, a specimen that could be kept in a museum. But because lemurs are so critically endangered, um, I know that, that Dr. Lewis and some other scientists got together and said, hey, we don't want to name them if we have to take one out of the wild because there's so few left. So um, 
what happened is there's a process. So they look at the, the genetic information, they look at the morphological measurements, um, they look at geographic data. Um, there's a lot of different things that go into the species concept model. And so, and also, you know, you can put all this information together, but it still has to be um, submitted to a, pu a publication, uh, a peer-reviewed publication. So it's reviewed by other scientists. So sometimes um, there's always like a race to see who can name the next species. And so sometimes they will propose a new species in a certain publication. And then in a, in a subsequent publication, they'll name that species. So um, I think what happened with the, 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 the mouse lemurs um, is that they, at first, the genetic information showed that that Mittermeier was a new species, that there was a net enough genetic difference. However, with, with the new technologies and stuff, they're able to um, sequence even greater um, sections of the, and, and get more millions and millions of base pair sequences of these animals that they can line up and look at all these phylogenetic charts. And so by doing that, they kind of found that the Mittermeierite was at, that the, the, these two that they thought were, were two different species were actually the same. And yeah. just one more tidbit on that is that it's so important to, before we can prioritize areas that need to be protected, it's so important to know what's there first. So for example, um, Lynn mentioned that we work in Kinjavatu and there's a mouse lemur species there, um, Microcebus jollier, um, which was named by, by um, my husband, Dr. Lewis, and it's a new species um, named after Allison Jolly, who was one of the first women uh, researchers in Madagascar and did so many things for Madagascar. So, um, you know, sometimes people are honored by having a lemur named after them. And it's actually found only in Kinjavatu. So nearby, Ranamathan also has a mouse lemur species, but it's Microcebus rufus. So just by elevating that Microcebus jollier to a uh, its own species, it be, that area of Kinjavatu becomes an AZE site zone, which means area for zero extinction. So yeah. it becomes a higher priority in, in conservation. So if a mining company or something wants to come in there, they're gonna have to get even more um, permissions and um, do more maybe biodiversity offsets. So it, it is important for conservation planning to know the number of species and um, which ones exist where to just prioritize conservation plan. Yeah. That's, that's great to know. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's everything. It's like so complicated, but it's really fascinating to know like the whole process of everything too. Yes. Okay. So back to the answers. So the question two, the, Second one was to name the three spe the species of the three main lemur characters in Madagascar. So we have King Julian, he's a ring-tailed lemur. So like that was a pretty easy question. <laughs> and then Mort is a mouse lemur. I don't think that they specify which mouse lemur species, but mouse lemur. And then Maurice is an eye eyes, the one that um, Susie's favorite species that we were talking about earlier with the big ears and the long finger. So yeah, it's really cool to see um, a movie and cartoon about Madagascar. I was excited when that came out. <laughs> and then question three, true or false, male and female lemurs hold equal amounts of power. So that one is actually false. That females are actually rural lemur troops. And this is really unusual um, in mammals and also in primates. So that means that females get like first dibs on food and resources. So that's kind of pretty interesting, makes lemurs like really unique and interesting. Okay, so question four, which of these is not true about a lemur species? So all of these are true. So if we wanna go back to that one. So this is, whoops. So the amount of cyanide daily that would kill a human, that's the bamboo lemur. The toxins and millipedes get rid of parasites, that's the black lemur. Um, the extra long middle finger, that's the eye eye that we talked about. And the lemur that's so small, it only weighs about an ounce, that's the smallest primate in the world, the Madame Births mouse lemur. 
and it lives only in the marshes around a single lake. This is the Lake Alawatra um, bamboo lemur. And this is, that's a species that's definitely on my bucket list because it seems really cool that it's actually lives in the reed beds around the lake and it's very endangered. Um, but it seems like really fascinating to go see. Okay. Here we are. Oh, okay. And then the, the last question in this round was, do lemurs like to move it, move it? <laughs> Which is a very important question. So the answer to that one was yes, unless they're in torpor. So Jessica, can you explain what torpor means? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so torpor, it's kind of an inactive state that an animal enters um, where like the metabolism, its heart rate and its body temperature are all drastically lowered and slowed down. Um, so you can think of it as kind of the mechanism of hibernation. So torpor is like the body's reaction to the environment that it's in, whereas hibernation is the actual, you know, the sleeping and, and the prolonged and preparation, think, you know, a bear out, you know, gathering food and then finding a den to sleep in, that's hibernation. Torpor is what's going on in the animal's body during hibernation. Um, so there are some mouse lemur species that experience short bouts of torpor, which last about 24 hours, um, but not true hibernation. But the fat-tailed dwarf lemur is actually one of the only, is the only primate known to actually truly hibernate. Uh, so what they do is they'll store fat deposits in their tail, hence their lovely name, <laughs> um, in preparation for hibernation, and then they'll go into torpor cycles. Um, so they'll like, have about 10 days of torpor, then there'll be a spike in their metabolism, and then they'll go back to torpor. And this cycle can last anywhere from to seven to about seven months. So it's pretty Wow. <laughs> That's a long time. And this yeah. photo is actually a fat tailed dwarf lemur. That's and it's cool, like once you know, you'll see the tail actually, it's it's all expanded when they're storing fat, and then you can see once they wake up from their torpor cycle, their hibernation cycle, it's skinny again. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it makes me think of that the theory that how lemurs got to Madagascar is floating on a raft of vegeta vegetation if they're able or, you know, ancient lemurs were able to hibernate, then that would kind of make sense that they were able to survive on the, on the journey. Definitely. <laughs> cool. Okay, Jessica. So we wanted to talk a little bit up to you with you about your work and also you've been working with us the last couple of months to create some um, learning materials that people can do for World Lemur Festival this week or anytime throughout the year if you want to learn about lemurs. So do you want to talk a little bit about them? Yeah, absolutely. Materials and any other like educational stuff that people can do? Sure. Uh, so like you mentioned, I've been working with LCN uh, as one of your science communication volunteers. And in my capacity doing that, I uh, developed some education materials. So there's three of them that uh, we worked on collaboratively, the Passport to Madagascar, um, the Lemur Documentary and Film Festival, and then a Citizen Science Lemur Ethogram activity. Hmm. So the Passport to Madagascar kind of stemmed from the idea of being able to travel around Madagascar and learn about lemurs in different regions without actually having to leave home, as any of us can't do that right now with the pandemic, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so, but this activity is made up of three different parts, um, and each one is themed around one of the featured lemur species for this year's World Lemur Festival each of which lives in a different part of Madagascar. Um, so the idea is to kind of learn a bit about each species and then you complete a short activity to reinforce that new knowledge and then you earn your passport stamp for that region. Nice, so what's the age group for that activity? Um, I believe, oh gosh, I can't. I think, was it like eight and up or something like I that? So, it, so on, on the LCN website, um, we've got each one kind of listed and you can, it, it'll describe like, I think this one's more for like elementary to middle school level. Yeah. Um, and you know, parents can do this at home with their kids. Teachers can use it in the classroom or virtually. So you know, it's, it's pretty flexible. Cool. Yeah. And you can find all these materials if you go to Lima Conservation Network website and then click on learn and then for educators. So what about the other ones, the film festival guide, what's yeah. that? About? So that one, the idea for this activity just kind of came from my own love of watching nature documentaries and films. Um, and I also think people tend to learn and retain information a bit better when there's a visual and storytelling aspect to it. So, you know, this is just a list of different documentaries that I found about 
lemurs, Madagascar, the culture, the animals. Um, so you can either watch one or two documentaries and answer some of the questions about each one, or you can watch them all and compare and contrast them, or you take a step further and you can make it like a, a nature documentary film club with your friends and family. So this one's pretty versatile too. Awesome. And then the last one is the ethogram. What's the ethogram? What's that uh, the ethogram is, um, it's kind of like an, a, a raw data sheet of observational data. Uh, so this activity was inspired by a lab assignment that I did for one of my college courses years ago, uh, <laughs> and an intern project that I did while I was working at one of the zoos. Um, so it's a great way to introduce students to the basics of behavioral research. So we can really learn a lot about animals from just observing them and watching them go about their day. Um, and you know, being able to gather information, organize it, and interpret it to form questions are all really important skills for life in general, but especially so for scientists. So I'm hoping that this activity can spark an interest in students to maybe pursue a STEM career. Cool. And you can watch lemurs either at a zoo or through a webcam or something like yeah, that. Yeah, a lot, a lot of zoos now, especially with this, with the pandemic having to close their doors, they've uh, put webcams, live streams, in front of their exhibits, so you can visit the zoo without really visiting the zoo if you can. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much yeah. for sharing all this stuff. Um, and if yeah, if you go to that the that page on our website, there's also materials from other organizations like the Lemur Conservation Foundation has some great stuff. They have a coloring book and, um, and also Pick Madagascar has a coloring book too that talks a lot about um, life in Madagascar and, um, and that one's in both Malagasy and in English. So, so it's really weird. There's lots of resources. Yeah, I think there's the most important thing about the educational resources is just having, you know, versatility to them that, you know, teachers can use them in a classroom, parents can use them at home, zoo educators, small groups, big groups, what have you. You know, we've had to shift how conservation education gets done recently, but the important thing is that we don't stop because, you know. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Okay, speaking of conservation. Round three is about lemurs. There's a couple like more lemur species questions and then we're moving into the lemur conservation. So let's get started with that. All right, the first question in round three is which lemur species settles their arguments with stink? This guy doesn't look particularly happy in this photo. <laughs> okay, the lemur species that settles their arguments with stink. Question two, which lemur species that's pictured here is one of the rarest primates in the world and is known as the angel of the forest due to its pure white fur? So we're looking for the species that's pictured here. Okay, question three. We kind of talked about this in one of the earlier questions, so if you've been paying attention, maybe you'll know. According to the 2020 IUCN Red List, what percentage of lemur species is endangered? So we know there's 111 species, so what percentage of those species is endangered? So we, the choices are 32%, 50%, 83%, 98%, or all 100%. Okay, so question four. This is a good one. This is another one of those like check all that apply kinds of questions. So conservationists are working across Madagascar to save lemurs from extinction. What types of work do they do? Um, so we have lots of choices. Teach kids and families about lemurs and forests, provide health care to Malagasy families, ecotourism projects, developing sustainable businesses, planting trees, scientific research, finding alternate food sources or all of these. So you can say, oh, maybe it's four of them, but not the other ones, or it's all of them, or whatever you guys think. Okay, let's move to question five. In round three, this is true or false. Lemurs in Madagascar are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Is that true or false? Okay, 
So before we get into the answers, I wanted to ask quickly, we'll talk a little bit more about how to help in the next section for trivia questions. But if Susie and Jessica, if you could just say, if, they, if you have one idea for how people can help, what would it be? What do you think, Susie? Okay, um, if I had to think about just one way people can help lemurs in Madagascar, I would just say, it, it's kind of two, but it, it really is one, is just to learn like you are right now about lemurs, about the, the threats proposed to lemurs, and then share what you learn. So just learning, becoming more aware, and, and share what you learned with others. I think that's a great first step. And it's good to inspire people. You know, the more you learn, the more interested you are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The more motivated you are maybe to help. Mm -hmm. cool. What do you think, Jessica? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely have to echo that. Um, just being being a lifelong learner. I mean, not even just with lemurs, but with you know conservation in general. You know, there's a lot of endangered species, um, and a lot of what's going on is it's it's anthropogenically caused, human induced causes that are 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 threatening these species. So, just absorbing as much information as you can um, and and sharing that. You know. Read books, articles, blog posts, listen to podcasts, watch documentaries, follow conservation organizations on social media, read their posts, just absorb yeah. everything. Yeah, and there's so much information out there, but and like you said, there's a lot of species that are endangered, but some of the ways you can help are sort of the same for lots of different species and just becoming more aware and like a, a, a concerned citizen. Great. Cool, so let's go into the round three answers. So we have, which lemur species settles their arguments with stink? That's the ring-tailed lemur, or the species name is lemur cata. They have stink fights, the males particularly, have stink fights when they wanna defend their territory or fight over food or whatever. Um, so the second question, which species is known as the angel of the forest for its white fur? That's the silky sifaka or the Propithecus candidus is the scientific name. And silky sifakas only live in Northeast Madagascar. I saw them last year in Marajeji National Park, which was awesome. Definitely recommend it. Um, question three, what percentage of lemur species is endangered? So 98%, the recent IUCN Red List meeting is has now 98% of lemur species are endangered. So there's a lot of work to do and um, a lot of work being done. So speaking of that work, so what types of work do conservationists do in Madagascar? So that's all of the above. So if we go back to that one, so that people are working around Madagascar doing all of these things. Um, it's really important to support Malagasy people and um, to help them have other ways of making money and other ways of feeding their families that aren't taking um, resources from the forest. So we need to, you know, all work together. Okay, and then the last one, true or false, lemurs, lemurs in Madagascar are particularly vulnerable to climate change. And that's true. So Lem or Madagascar is an island and all islands are more vulnerable than other places to climate change. Um, Madagascar is already seeing a lot of effects from climate change. In southern Madagascar, there's extreme droughts over the last few decades. Um, and local people say it's just, it's getting worse. And um, also in the north, there's a lot of um, heavy rain typhoon season and a lot of flooding because of that. And, um, roads get destroyed and homes and so there's a lot of um, effects of climate change already happening that are affecting people and the wildlife. Okay, so round four, moving into the last round is how you can help. So first we want to talk a little bit about, you know, if lemurs in Madagascar are affected by climate change, then that means that people like me and you at home, we have an impact on climate change. So how can we lower our carbon footprint? Um, and that's just through everyday things that you can make choices every day. So for the first question, it says how much, approximately how much of the world's electricity is produced from renewable sources? So the options are 30%, 20%, 10%, 5%, or 1%. 
So that's it. kind of a hard question, I think. So how much of the world's electricity is produced from renewable sources right now? And then a second one, this is a good question. I feel like I didn't really know the answer right at first. So which uses less water, washing dishes by hand or washing dishes in an energy efficient dishwasher? What do you guys think? Okay, question three. Eating meat is one of, this is true or false. Eating meat is one of the main drivers of both climate change and deforestation. True or false? Okay, the fourth question in this section, which of the following other activities can help reduce your climate footprint? So it's another one of those, choose one, two, three, four, whatever, or all of the above. So which of these can help reduce your climate footprint? Driving the speed limit, turning your thermostat down one degree in the winter and up one in the summer, eating meat only a couple times a week, buying toilet paper made with 100% recycled paper products, buying energy efficient light bulbs, or all of the above. What do you guys think? Okay, the last question in this round and the last question, all trivia today <laughs> is other than reducing your carbon footprint, how else can you help lemurs in Madagascar? So this is a check one, two, check them all, whatever. Learn about lemurs and tell your friends and family. Susie and Jessica were talking about that earlier. Go to a zoo and see lemurs to learn more about them. Follow lemur organizations on social media. The answer D, this one's really important. Post about lemurs for the World Lemur Festival. We're in the World Lemur Festival right now. So just saying. Create a fundraiser for a lemur organization. Volunteer for your zoo or lemur organization. Buy gifts that support lemur conservation. Hmm. Um, use the Ecosia search engine. Travel to Madagascar to see lemurs in the wild or all of the above. Okay, so that is the last round. Do we need to go back to see any? All right, so let's jump right into the answers for this. So how much of the world's electricity is sustainable? That's 10%. So it's not as low as 1%, but we could definitely have room for improvement here. So that's like sustainable electricity would be like solar power, wind power, yeah. And which uses less water, washing dishes and an energy efficient dishwasher? So yeah, I thought that was an interesting tidbit. True or false, eating meat is one of the main drivers of deforestation and climate change. That one is true. So that doesn't mean you have to go totally vegan. I'm actually vegan, but you know, I know people like eating meat, but just you know, not eating it every day or only for breakfast or whatever. Um, just lowering your consumption. And what other activities can help reduce your climate footprint? That was all of them, all of the ones you mentioned. So that's um, driving the speed limit, actually. This was surprising to me, actually uses less fuel. Um, and then there's a search engine called Ecosia, which is they actually plant trees through the Eden Reforestation Projects. And one of those, or that's the next question, oops. I skipped ahead a little bit. So how else can you help lemurs in Madagascar? That's also all of the above. Um, so yeah, I was saying the Ecosia search engine plants trees through Eden reforestation projects. And they Eden plants trees around the world, but also in Madagascar. And so they've planted millions and millions of trees in Madagascar. And so it's really impressive. Um, and just by using Ecosia instead of Google, you can help plant trees. So that's pretty cool and super easy. Everybody can do that. All right, so add up your points. Did anybody get all of them right? Almost all of them? Okay. So we wanted to talk a little more to Susie um, about her work in Madagascar and with people in Madagascar. Um, so 
I know you work really close with local families and communities and you, all of your project sites. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you wanted to share any stories, inspiring stories from people that you work with. Sure, I'd love to. I mean, I, and, and I already told Lynn like, hey, she needs to edit me if I go on too long. <laughs> um, but I, I would love to tell a couple stories. One of my favorite stories is um, actually working in, in the Eastern rainforest of Kinjibachu. So maybe what I'll do is share like one quick story from each site we work at. And um, okay. so we are working at all the sites that we work at. We're so lucky because we partner with um, my husband, Dr. Lewis, and they're doing the research in all of these areas and they have community-based programs. So they're planting millions of trees, uh, native species, and doing a lot of reforestation projects. So it, it makes for a nice um, partnership. Uh, long story short, um, we were are, are educating. So we're like the education arm of the, the work that they're doing. So we want local people to understand the why behind planting trees and protecting lemurs. And so one thing that we try to be so cognizant of is to, when we're working with local communities in Madagascar is to never do like more harm than good. And we want to, we want to not go in just pushing all of our um, conservation ideas, but asking them what they need and how can we help. So um, in Kinjavatu, we are doing like tree planting activities, reforestation. And the cool thing about the, their, the reforestation project that they're doing is the foundation of the, the tree planting is based upon the lemurs. So they found, um, you know, Jessica mentioned the black and white rough lemur. Um, that lemur is, is frugivorous, which means like it just eats a lot of fruit. About 98% of its diet is fruit. And so when it eats the fruit, like, like what's inside fruit? Like maybe once someone can type into the chat, like what do you find when you open up the fruit? A seed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to try to be a little interactive there. Okay, awesome, Liam. Okay, so seeds are inside of fruit, and what ha what they have discovered by by using the scientific method is that when these black and white rough lemurs are eating the the, the fruits, um, the seeds germinate at like a, a much higher rate, like eighty five percent rate, um, when they take the seeds from the lemur poop versus if they pick that same seed from the fruit in the tree. So these um, lemurs are are the the foundation for future generations of forests and listen people in madagascar are living well below the poverty line they make less than two dollars a day if they're lucky enough to have a job and so they're using the forest for basic needs for all their food um, they get their water there they build their houses from the lumber um, they use fuel wood from the forest. They get their medicines from plants in the forest. So as, an ed as the education component of this, we go into the schools and talk to kids about, um, we call it the lemur poop cycle. And so <laughs> we found like, we've been working there for, a, we're in our 11th year working in Kinjavatu. And so these kids that were in our programs at the very beginning, we work with 12 schools in Kinjavatu, um, all know, the, the lemur poop cycle. They know like the lemur eats the fruit, it poops up the seeds, it grows into the next generation of the forest, and that forest becomes like a resource for local people and a home for the lemurs. And so um, there was a, a period of time where um, we didn't get to touch on this a lot, but a lot of uh, the destruction of forest habitats in Madagascar comes from the type of farming that they do called tabi. And it's a slash and burn agriculture where they just burn down sections of the forest in order to plant, um, like one of the questions, rice. Because the Malagasy people love rice. They, they, they love to eat rice for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. So... Um, in, in a nutshell, they had these forest patrols and these local people were um, coming across people who were, because the tabi is, is illegal and cutting down trees is illegal in protected areas. So they have this like community led forest patrol and they had arrested three people. And these three people were taken to the Malagasy courts. And the first man um, had attacked the forest ranger with like a, a machete type thing. They called a coop coop in Madagascar. And so he was immediately sent straight to jail. The second man um, was, was the father. 
of the of the third man and he said you know he was just trying to uh he knew it was illegal but he wanted to try to find like food for his family and so he was about to do the slash and burn agriculture and then the third kid says like hey um I don't live there anymore, but I heard my father was about to cut these trees down. So I came back to King Javatu, but I want you to know, um, I'm one of the kids from, from Susie's class in Conservation oh. Fusion, and we know all about the forest cycle, the lemur poop cycle, and we know that the forest brings us clean water and place for the animals, and we can earn an income through ecotourism, and we're planting trees. So I just came back to try to stop my father from practicing this this activity that I know in the long term is is not beneficial so anyway he was yeah he was released so his father did go to jail also for you know for breaking the law but the 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 judge the Malagasy judge like let this kid go and he wasn't charged so we can see that we are having an impact Mm -hmm. and then um we have very different uh, we talked about before like the different cultures and, and things like that so we work in the in the south and it's they have extreme droughts there sometimes they don't have rain there for like three and four years at a time they live near the ocean so most of the people are are fisher people fishermen and fisherwomen and um but they have like a very strong like ties with like spiritual and cultural ties with the forest and with the lemurs and the the radiated tortoises that they live near by and so there um they just didn't have a school so we started uh like a, a school there and so we actually have since built two schools um dream the dream school because they said it was their dream for their children to have an education and now we have a scholarship program um we have we just had the first year of the dream school, we had seven kids qualified for and passed the national exam. And this year we had 12 more um, okay. students that passed the, the national exam. So we helped send them to secondary school, which is like six hours away. And then those kids we hope um, are gonna come back and become like teachers and midwives and, and things like that. And then the last okay. night we were, where we work at is in the very tip top of the island and it's where um the community is with the, the northern sportive lemur and it probably is like the most endangered primate on earth um probably more than orangutans and gorillas that we might see in zoos and it's just a small it's called the northern sportive lemur lepilemur septentrinalis and it's about the size of like a kitten it's a nocturnal lemur, and so uh, I noticed on the slides, Lynn had several pictures of the, the sportive lemurs, and there are def many different species, but the northern sportive lemur um, has a very small population of maybe only a, around 50 to 75 individuals, um, and they only exist in this one little forest. So there, we work with like local women's associations because they shared with us that the number one reason that they have to they feel like they have to cut down the forest is to make charcoal. So they actually burn the trees underground until the yeah. wood becomes charcoal and they sell that charcoal as a fuel source to people. And that's the only way that they really know how to make an income. So we helped the local women's association to identify their strengths and they all wanted to be crafters. And so um, we did like business trainings with them and they now sell their embroidery and baskets and such to um, tourists because they have a lot of tourists um, in, the, in that area. And they even have their own like little Facebook page, the women's yeah, organization. Cool. So yeah, those are just a few ways that we work with, with local people and try to like spend a lot of time asking them what their needs are because before we can um, try to save lemurs, we have to meet people's basic needs. So once yeah. those basic needs are met, then they, they can have a little bit of a luxury to even think about conservation. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing all your story. Oh, your work is very inspiring. Thank and you. Um, it was great 
when I went to Madagascar several years ago to visit Kianjavatu and met with some of the teachers there that you work with and that was really awesome um, and they everybody speaks very highly of your organization there so it's a good oh, testament you. okay do we have any questions from the audience whether in Facebook live or in the webinar does anybody have any questions for any of us or even just curious about certain species or whatever And also I want to say um, to, if you want to learn more about Conservation Fusion and Susie's work, you can find them on Facebook and also Instagram, I believe, right? And their website. Um, and Jessica Louisiana Lamer Foundation also has a Facebook and also website. I'm not sure if you guys have Instagram yet. Yeah. Um, we, 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 we dabble. <laughs> it's yeah. Trying mostly to keep track of all of the social media. <laughs> yeah, mostly Facebook. And then also the Lemur Conservation Network. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook too. Um, and we share regularly like cute pictures, lots of facts about lemurs, and then how you can help and even info about traveling in Madagascar and stuff like that. Okay, so we have one question, a couple of questions. Um, what is the most common lemur? I guess, I mean, I think that um, in zoos, it seems like around the world, the ring-tailed lemur is probably the most commonly seen. Um, in Madagascar, it really depends where you are because the species are all over the country and they sort of specialize in their location. So like, um, there is a species called the common brown lemur, which is in the Eastern rainforests. Um, but it really depends on where you are. I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I would say for sure and echo that ringtail lemurs in zoos are probably the most common. And then fun fact, um, there's never been an injury in a zoo. The injuries just do not do well in captivity. Uh, so it's even more, that makes them even more rare and more important to make sure that we're conserving them in the wild. Yeah, and there, I think a lot of the sportive lemurs, it's really rare to have them survive in captivity too. And I think what's, and also I've heard stafakas can be really challenging to hold, to have in zoos um, because, you know, the lemurs live all over Madagascar, the different species, and they're eating all different types of foods. So the, and a lot of the plant species that are in Madagascar are also endemic, so they don't live anywhere else. So it's really hard to exactly replicate the diet in any zoo. So um, the species like ring-tailed lemurs who maybe are more adaptable um, to captivity do a little bit better, but things like shafakas, they eat a lot of leaves. So if those leaves are gonna be different if they're in a zoo versus in the wild, it's really hard to replicate that. So yeah, it's an interesting, interesting point, Jessica. Oh, um, so there's a question on Facebook. Susie, what was the name of the kitten size lemur that you talked about? That was the northern sport of lemur. I thought I was going to sneeze, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's called Lepa lemur septentrionalis, and it's also the northern sportive lemur. And all you mentioned the sportive lemurs. Like I said, like it is hard to sometimes keep track of the numbers of species but there's lots of sportive lemurs mm -hmm. um, and the sportive lemurs interestingly um you know i talked about my husband dr lewis naming 22 species of lemurs which is kind of crazy but you know how that came about originally is because they were one of the first groups to start to study nocturnal lemurs so when originally when scientists were looking at the lemurs they weren't looking at any of the nighttime lemurs the nocturnal ones and sportive lemurs are um, primarily nocturnal. So they're, they're kind of like sleeping in tree holes during the day and more um, out and about at night foraging for food. Yeah, and it seems like the, the yeah. nocturnal lemurs, other than the eye eye, it's sort of hard to tell them apart by just like a photo, um, kind oh, of know, sure. like where it was found um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Cause yeah. some of those people will ask like, what specific species is this? And there's a lot of nocturnal. So the mouse lemurs are nocturnal. Eye eyes, um, 
the sportive lemurs, the fat-tailed dwarf lemurs, the Caragallus species are nocturnal. So um, actually it's one of the things that we do with Malagasy children in our programs is go on conservation camp and they love going, staying until it gets dark mm. so that we can see all the, the nocturnal species that they've never had a chance to, to see for the most yeah. part because they are only out, out at night. Yeah. It's crazy. When you go to Madagascar, I always feel like you get like a sore neck from staring up in the trees nonstop. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and walking around at night with flashlights and <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. awesome. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions we have from the audience. Thank you guys so much. Um, and just as a reminder, you can visit our websites here, lemurconservationnetwork.org, conservationfusion.org, and Louisiana Lemur Foundation, is that, no, I'm forgetting what that website is. It's um, louisianalemurs.org, yes. So thank you to Laura, who is handling the, the back end here. And also thank you to Susie and Jessica so much for all of your awesome chats. And um, thanks to all the audience. And I hope everybody has a wonderful week this week for Full of Lemurs. Check out all of our social media and share lots of tidbits with your friends and family. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.